את אברהם, לא ילדה לו, אלא שפחה מיצרית ושמה הגר, בו את אומר שרי אל אברהם. בוא נעל שפחתי, יבנה ממנה, וישמע Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Zamir Coral Foundation's Taking Note, Conversations About Music in Challenging Times. <clears throat> My name is Jim Ball, and I'm a member of the board of the Zamir Coral Foundation. Some of you may also know me from seeing me scurrying around and taking pictures at the North American Jewish Coral, Coral Festival. Uh, I'm proud to be part of this important and innovative work of the foundation in preserving and advancing Jewish choral music around the world. Our introductory music you heard at the beginning is a portion of a recording about the story of Hagar by our special guest this afternoon, the amazing and groundbreaking musician, Khalid Dardash, the Persian descended vocalist and scholar, Dr. Khalid Dardashi has earned a reputation as a trailblazing performer of Middle Eastern music and founder and leader of the internationally renowned all-female musical group, Devon. And through her multidisciplinary commissioned works, the naming and monajat. As a cultural anthropologist, she specializes in contemporary Mizrahi music and culture in Israel and has held positions at NYU, Rutgers, and JTS. She's a visiting scholar at the Jewish Theological Seminary and cantor musician in residence at the Jewish Community Project. And of course, our other conversationalist today is the man who makes this all possible, Matthew Lazar, the founder and director of the Zamir Choral Foundation. He has created the renaissance of Jewish choral music in North America. As conductor of the Zamir Chorale, founder of the North American Jewish Choral Festival, Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, and Zamir No Dead, he has created and promoted transdenominational, transgenerational, 
and transpolitical Jewish musical communities for over 40 years. He's conducted choral and choral orchestral Jewish themed concerts across the United States and Israel, and has conducted the great cantors of this generation. He was a co-founder of Teku, the first American Hebrew folk rock band. It's a good one. And I'm blessed to count Mati as a friend going back to our days as music students at Ithaca College, where among other things, we both studied composition with the late composer, Carol Husa, and where Mati could be heard playing Beatles songs in the practice rooms. And now, Mati, I will turn it over to you to begin our conversation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Galit, for joining us, and thank you to you all uh, for joining us in this conversation. Galit, you come from a storied Jewish-Persian music family. Could you uh, share some of that history with us? Absolutely. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. It's a real a big honor, and I've been a fan of the work that, that you do for a long time. So um, yes, I am very fortunate to come from a really, from a very rich heritage of, um, of music in general and, um, and Jewish music. So my grandfather, Yunus Dardashti, he was one of the most famous singers of Persian classical music in his time in the 1950s and 1960s in Iran. Um, he sang on uh, a weekly spot on the radio before there was television, and he uh, sang at the Shah's palace. He sang at concert halls throughout uh, throughout Iran, and um, so that's uh, you know that's that's my grandfather and my father, who also grew up in Iran. Um, he had his own television show in Iran that was, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if you, you knew this, Mati, you, you knew, um, I know you know my father. He, um, he, when he was 19 years old, he sang international folk songs on uh, the beginning of Tehran television. And that was right before he left to come uh, to the U.S. And then on my mom's side, my mom um, is a musician. She attended the high school of performing arts, um, LaGuardia, the fame school, and um, playing guitar. And she and my father began singing together when they met. I mean, that's also an amazing story that we don't have time for, but they met in Israel, my parents. And um, when my father ultimately uh, came to the United States, they were already uh, connected and um, the two of them began performing together. And then when, um, when myself and my two sisters were born, we joined the act as um, you know, a, a singing family known as uh, sometimes just the Dardashti family and sometimes a dash of Dardashti. So um, yeah, so we were the, the Jewish Von Trapps or something like that. And um, we sang all different kinds of, of music. We sang uh, a lot of Jewish music, but also international folk songs. And my father being the amazing tenor that he was, he sang arias and, you know, ultimately, um, you know, and I, I sang some Broadway stuff. I mean, we were kind of a very, a potpourri act. Um, it was fun. We sang, we sang together lots of harmony and, um, uh, my parents played the guitar. We had a pianist that played some some things. But this is sort of my my musical background. So you had a great Western tradition background, singing Broadway, singing the international classics, and uh, b but of course uh, your grandfather's um, skill in singing Persian music and the skill that we heard you singing in Hagar Sarah just a, a, a few minutes ago. Is that something that you learned from your grandfather or tell us, you know, usually when, uh, when a child is the incarnation of a musical style, very often people presuppose that it was learned in the crib, that it was learned uh, in that direct kind of way. Is that yeah. what happened to you? I wish that had happened. Um, but I mean, I, I should say that I did grow up with my parents um, absolutely giving me music at, at birth. Um, so, but in terms of the Middle Eastern background, 
uh, I didn't really grow up singing Middle Eastern music as people assume that I did because um, of the music that I sing today. Um, we didn't sing in, in, in our family, uh, in our family band, we didn't sing a lot of uh, very Middle Eastern, you know, maqam based or dustka in the Persian tradition based music, because it's hard to dabble in that music. Um, you know, we sang um, but, you know, we sang stuff that's as Middle Eastern as it got. But um, we didn't, uh, I, you know, I wasn't at all, I didn't know my grandfather. And um, I, I, I knew him in that I met him, but I didn't know him well. Uh, I grew up, and uh, I was lucky to, to get to know him and to get to hear him sing at different weddings because he was this big star. When we lived in LA, um, I remember when he would be in town, we would go to some weddings and people would say, oh, please, please, will you sing a song, you know, at a wedding? And he would sing and everybody, you know, all of the Persian Jews and tarantulas were, you know, just totally um, uh, just amazed by him. And for me, hearing him sing this very Persian music, this, this girl that grew up going to um, a very Ashkenazi, hearing Ashkenazi synagogue music and you know, as an American girl, I was sort of, um, I thought it was beautiful and interesting, but it was very foreign to me. I didn't grow up hearing, um, hearing that musical style uh, much at all. I mean, I would hear, I would hear at home, I would hear my father listening to La Traviata and La Boheme and, you know, listening to those, to, to that music. So that music was familiar to me. My father, this Iranian Jew, who was a famous person in, uh, in Iran before he came to the U.S. to um, to study to be an architect, by the way, before he became a cantor. Um, you know, he didn't uh, he didn't plan to go to cantorial school, but ultimately he ended up at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and um, so that's where I grew up. I heard my dad singing in conservative with a capital C synagogues. And that was mostly the, um, the Jewish music that I was exposed to, along with all of the other music um, that an American uh, person is exposed to. I remember meeting your grandfather at uh, JTS when I was a faculty member at uh, Cantor's Institute. Uh, your grandfather had come to visit and to illustrate his incredible vocal style, and of course, to, to visit your uncles who were students at the Cantor's Institute at the time. And I remember vividly him singing what appeared to be two notes at exactly the same time. And for 20 minutes, people were hovering around, not believing what they were hearing. Yeah. And he could do it. He explained later that he was able not to sing two notes at once, but two notes at such proximity that the human ear, which is what we were equipped with, could actually only hear it as two simultaneous notes. It was the first time I ever heard anything even remotely like that. And uh, I still remember where I was standing in the seminary when that happened. Wow. But, yeah, but since you are kind of a creature of the West and the, to a certain extent the East, uh, is there a difference for you? How does it feel to you when you're singing um, Western style music? And how does it feel emotionally when you're singing and channeling, I guess, is maybe too strong a word, but for me, it feels very channeled, the style and essence of your grandfather. Thank you. That's a big compliment. Um, thank you. Um, well, you know, for me, I, I don't know. It feels, it feels at this point, it feels natural. Um, but when I sing, <laughs> I've been told this, that when I sing, um, certain, especially Persian Jewish music, <laughs> I've been told that I have a slight Persian accent when I, um, when I sing that music. Because someone recently, I mean, just last week, I, I, um, I, I learned how to sing Persian Shir Hashirim very recently, and I was singing it for someone. And they said, you know, where did you learn that accent? And I didn't know what they were referring to. 
So I don't think they just meant the language, though. I think it's the whole thing. But I, I do feel in a certain sense, because I've, I've listened to my grandfather's voice now so much, um, that in a certain sense, I'm channeling um, him, uh, though it's not, it's not deliberate <laughs> um, in any way. But at the same time, because I grew up singing um, uh, a lot of Western classical music, I'm not always aware when I'm singing quarter tones, when I'm singing a note that's not on the piano. Like I can't, I have to actually consciously think about it um, because I learn, I learn so much of the music now that I sing by ear and, and not through, um, and not through sheet music. I have to consciously think about, am I singing right now? Um, Am I, am I singing a quarter tone or am I not? So, um, so it feels, I guess one, one answer is that it, it feels completely natural to me at this point. Um, I can sort of go back and forth between musical styles pretty easily and not notice. You're making me think of something that's uh, slightly unrelated to what we're talking about, but uh, when you mentioned about quarter tones, I started thinking maybe when you're singing uh, or when your father would sing Mozart or something like that, he would drift uh, a little bit quarter tony in either direction. And I, my sister uh -huh. is a very great harpsichordist. Wow. And she, one, of, one of her uh, loves and passions is discussing even tempered tuning, uh, which means that the octaves really line up with each other. But in the glory days of harpsichord playing, if you played middle C octave and you played three octaves up, they weren't tuning the octaves. They were, they were tuning in a different way. And so by the time you got two octaves up, you were singing, you were playing quarter tone sharp. Huh. So wow. There's, a, there's something about that that crosses over in the West and the East. Yeah, and that sometimes just um, can fluidly happen. <laughs> Is there an emotional difference to you when you hear um, some great piyut, I know that you're a lover and, and, and extremely knowledgeable about piyut Tim. Is there a difference when you hear that music in a psycho-emotional way or in a, in a cultural way um, than when you're listening to, and I'm sure being moved by some recording of your father's or you're hearing, still hearing your father sing operatic material or something from the classic repertoire? Um. I think, you know, look, music is so connected to memory that it would really depend what it was. You know, I, um, I there are so many things that I do. Um, I work also as um, I sing a lot of um, Western cantorial music, Ashkenazi um, cantorial music, and my, I was taught by my father. And so when I lead a high holiday music and I'm singing some of the, you know, the, you know, a Shema Koleinu um, that I learned, uh, that I heard my father sing. Shema Koleinu, you know, like uh, a piece like that. It's, it's very, it's very nostalgic. Like I feel like I'm channeling my father in a, um, in a certain way. So um, it really just depends on uh, it, you, music, as I'm sure all of um, you know, everyone here <laughs> with me today knows. I mean, it, it's so it takes you back to wherever you were, kind of when you learned the song, whether it's the Beatles or it's um, you know uh, Jewish music in the synagogue or um, a piyut that I learned at the synagogue that my grandparents founded in Rishon LeZion in Israel. I mean, music has really a unique and powerful way to, to bring you back to those moments of your life. And so it really depends on the specific piece. Um, or if it's, you know, having heard my father sing, um, uh, you know, a big role, a, a big tenor opera role. Um, all of those moments are just very, very um, present when you hear when you hear a song. You're immediately brought back um, to to those moments. So I wouldn't say that um, I wouldn't say that the that it's um, 
that it's that it's different for me because I mean, in, in a certain sense, you know, I grew up also hearing my father sing a little bit, not so much, but some um, Middle Eastern, some Persian music that he would bring as a chazan, like, um, my, you know, my favorite piyut, El Nora Alila, which I heard my father sing always in the Persian style as I, um, as I grew up, and I never really knew any other way. So could we okay. ask you to could we ask you to give a little illustration? Oh yes, of course. It's my favorite. Um, <laughs> it's my favorite uh, high holiday piyut, and it's this very you know um, dramatic moment at the end of Yom Kippur in the Neila service, which you know literally Neila literally means locking, and it's your last chance to get good with God, and um, and then this powerful moment this powerful moment happens. And for me, it was always sung this way. And it never, I never made the distinction between, oh, is this Middle Eastern or is this Ashkenazi? I just heard it as, you know, that's, that's El Nora Alila to me. And, um, uh, that's that's my memory, uh, and so for sure for me when I'm singing that I'm really channeling my father, who I heard um, as a chazan singing that piece. It's so interesting that you uh, describe that great moment of just just as Naila is starting, because in, as I'm sure you know, in many uh, real Ashkenazi, so to speak, uh, shuls, you would never hear that musical approach because you would hear a much more subservient uh, bakasha request to God. It wouldn't be a demand of God. It would be, uh, or even confidence that God will forgive you. Like, who sings we've sinned in major? Not too many people. You know, so that's a fascinating moment. But let me ask you this. When you sang that Shema Koleno that you learned from your father, as you're singing it, and you're so comfortable as a, as a performer or a shlichat sibur, do are you ever tempted in that moment to let the other half of your personality drift into that that western tune and, and and allow you or control you to improvise in a quarter tone way that would bring both parts together um i i'm sure i do it <laughs> um not 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 with the quarter tones but you know i have to tell you and um I hope this isn't going to be blasphemy to um, to uh, to all of you who I know are so committed to um, um, to sheet music, but most of the these these uh, pieces that are um, these beautiful pieces that um, most people learn through music, I learned by ear, and so um, I'm absolutely adding nuances to them um and uh <laughs> yeah and i because that's the tradition that i am uh, come from you know like most of the music if you a, a piyut and just so that we're all on the same page you know a, a piyut is a um a religious poem that is sung Right in the Jewish tradition, and everybody here knows many, many piyutim, Adon Olam, Lechadodi, Yigdal, um, etc. Um, and any time you sing that piyut, you sing it a little bit differently. And um, and it's a great question uh, that you that you you've asked because nobody's ever asked that to me before. But I. I absolutely take the same approach to all of the Western classical music <laughs> that I um, that I sing. I mean, maybe not Broadway, um, but uh, but cantorial music, Western um, uh, Western cantorial music, because it is so improvisatory. Anyway, I mean that music is very improvisatory, and so even though these pieces were written by actual people. And I know this can be very, um, I know there are people that feel like you must sing a piece exactly the way a composer wrote it. Um, and people are very, uh, um, feel very strongly about that. Um, I, I, um, 
I unfortunately do take many liberties with all, I treat, it's equal opportunity. I treat all of the music um, that I sing alike. And that means that I, um, you probably will never hear me sing the same piece exactly the same way. Well, great artists never repeat their performances exactly. <laughs> the Mati, Mati. Yes. Let me just uh, remind people that if they have questions, I forgot to do this at the beginning. If they have questions, please put them into the chat column at the bottom of your screen and we'll be able to get to them as we get to the uh, Q&A at the end. When you said something uh, just a minute ago, Galit, about um, the adherence to the strict uh, music as it is written, of course, there are things called performance practice, but the first idea that came to my mind was the difference between Tor Shebechtav and Tor Shebaalpeh our written tradition and our oral tradition. And of course they need to go a hand in hand. Absolutely. So that's the, one of the blessings of not being trapped in the written word. But if you, can't, if you can't write down something, how is it transmitted to people who are not in your inner circle? That is, that is one of the challenges of, uh, you know, the great thing about Bach I learned when I was a very young little child prodigy was I said, boy, this is unbelievable. And my piano teacher said, can you imagine what his improvisations must have been like? Mm. If this is what he managed just to write down. So there's Absolutely. a way. Yes, um, we're in full agreement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to press you a little bit about the piyut and the history of the piyut because I think even though people know their liturgical texts and um, the Ibn Ezra is probably the most famous, the 12th century Python, Pythonist, uh, but in our tradition, in the cult, in the Ashkenazi tradition, most of the piyutim are unfortunately not sung, even though they were originally sung. But in many cases, we just read them. And I think most of our audience, if we took a monkey survey, would be shocked to learn that Adon Alam and Yigdal are actually started as piyutim. And I know you have a thought about, and the history of the piyutim, about how they were even the service was so regular that people were more interested in the P.O. Tim. Could you yeah. talk about that? Yes. Um, yeah, I love talking about um, this subject because um, these people who composed these, uh, these P.O. Tim that are in our Sidorim, in our Machzorim, you know, we think about them often as fixed because it's like, oh, well, you know, it's the end of the service. It's time to do Adon Olam um, or it's time to do Yigdal. But this, um, this whole practice, the people who wrote them, you know, who were they? I mean, they were artists and they were people who wanted to bring innovation and excitement into um, the prayer service. You know, they couldn't, they, they couldn't do the sacrifices anymore. And so, you know, um, it was about keeping this, keeping the community together and keeping it alive. And so you had um, members of the community who were very knowledgeable. You had to be very knowledgeable because all these PU team are referencing Bible and, um, um, you know, later Talmud and Midrash. But um, the idea was always to um, to write things that could enhance uh, the service and could make it um, alive. And then it was a populist movement. People fell in love with these specific PU team. And they said, oh, well, we have to always, um, you know, sing this piyut. And we have to always end the service with it. Or we always have to have it, you know, uh, at this point in the Amidah, we have to have that one because people fell in love with them and almost to the chagrin of many rabbis who wanted to keep the, you know, the service um, uniform and the same wherever they were. Different communities fell in love with this pute and different communities fell in love with this pute. And so you have, um, that's why when you go and you travel to different places, you see that they're singing different um, texts because they don't, their, their pseudonym aren't always the same. But at a certain point, um, it, the, the, the services were so full of putim that the rabbis excised them. And, um, and so many of them fell away and we don't, you know, have them anymore, but many of them, um, we just have the text, right? We don't know 
but they were all sung. A piyut uh, is like, you can't have, um, you can't not sing a piyut. It was meant to be sung. It's sort of like, you know, the body without a soul or a soul without a body. It was an integrated thing. And sometimes people, there were many historical periods where people didn't understand the words, by the way. And what connected them was the music. It was the music that, um, that was a really, really important, powerful uh, way that people connected to the service. It's making me think your last remark about how the music connects the people to the service. I never thought of the connection and the similarity between the appeal of a certain kind of Hasidic approach to davening uh, and to this Sephardi approach to davening, uh, mm -hmm. except insofar as it's full-throated and, uh, and, and not, ent not intellectual, and the Vilna Gaon would not be very happy about that. But uh, other people apparently... Uh, but, the not just, yeah, but not just Sephardic. I mean, I'm talking about, um, you know, there were many historical periods where people, you know, apparently didn't understand the surface that much and so um that's why the music kind of kept that's what kept people engaged uh, you mentioned that the rabbis excised the love of the piyutim and the first thought that comes to my mind is how how the uh kaddish text uh yitkadal v'yitkadash which doesn't speak about death of course but speaks about god's greatness how people in ancient times, after the temple, began to consider it some kind of a mystical verbal amulet and mm -hmm. would invoke it at all times, having nothing to do with anything except a wishing. And the rabbis had to excise that and were left with just five or so examples in the service uh -huh. because people were so attracted to that. I want to ask you a little more about, your, about the cultural anthropology and this is like a chicken and the egg uh, question. Which came first, your, your return to the Persian vocal style uh, or a cultural anthropology? Did they, how did they work hand in hand? Or was it one before the other or, to, or together? Yeah. Um, kind of at the same time, but this, how, it, how, it, how it came about was that I, you know, I went to Israel my junior year of college, and for the first time I learned about, I understood about Mizrahim, Middle Eastern Jews. Um, and then I understood my grandfather's story because, you know, he, my grandfather, as this famous singer in Iran, he immigrated with my grandmother and, um, and their family in the 1960s. And he was this famous singer. He was able to continue flying back to Iran to perform. And he did that um, until he couldn't in 79. And um, I never really knew the story though, of what happened to my grandfather after 79 and um, after he wasn't able to perform in Iran. And I started learning more about the history of Middle Eastern Jews in Israel and, and some of that a very difficult history. Uh, for Middle Eastern Jews in terms of um, in, in, in terms of their culture not being appreciated in Israel. And um, it led me to ask more questions. And ultimately, I wanted to learn more about my grandfather's history. And so I decided to study cultural anthropology. And so while I was a graduate student in, at the University of Texas at Austin, I met some other musicians and uh, I was really interested since I was studying Middle Eastern music. By the way, I wanted to originally go to Iran. That was my original plan was I was gonna do research in Iran and that it became, there was this moment where it seemed like it could be possible and then it was clear that I could not. And so I shifted to Israel and studying Middle Eastern Jews in Israel. And um, I started at the same time since I was studying this music, I started, started getting more immersed in Middle Eastern Jewish music. And I started this band called Divan in Austin, Texas many years ago. And um, that's kind of where it all started. Um, but in the let beginning- me into, let, me, let me ask how the third missing piece that we haven't talked about, uh, having to do with Piyut, but connected to this other mm -hmm. dialectic you were just mentioning, the spiritual Kabbalistic component of the Piyut. 
Yeah. I know that you feel deeply about that uh, and it shines through when you're singing. How does that, is that a, an additional component or is that something that's connected to um, a development of an emotional development that comes to you when you're combining this uh, love of music? H how does that work for you? Well, um, so in the 16th century, this is this was the period where um, you know there was there was a, a it was a very spiritual period in general um, for Jewish practice. You know, it's the period where Kabbalah Shabbat came about, and there was this practice called Bakashot, where Jews they were trying they were experimenting with all different ways where they could become closer to God through. Um, different Kabbalistic ways. And one that I think is really interesting with, in terms of piyut is that Jews began gathering for bakashot. This is this practice of between Simchat Torah and Pesach on Friday night, between say the hours of like 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. before Shachari, people would gather in the synagogue and sing this large repertoire of music, uh, of putim, that are based on that specific parasha. And, um, and in the Middle Eastern Jewish world, not all of it, but in the Arab Middle Eastern world, there's a different makam, there's a different way, mode, that you sing for every parasha. So all of the repertoire of that week was that um, with, okay. Yes. So anyway, that's a really interesting practice that, um, that continues still to this day to a, a very small um, uh, minority of people still do the bakashot. You can hear if you go to Israel and there are cer certain synagogues where that practice still happens. So all these PU team, there's just this vast um, resource of, um, of PU team that uh, that you have more, that's why you have more in the Middle Eastern Jewish world of Piyutim, is that they have many um, practices that are connected to these, um, uh, to these Piyutim. And in terms of my own um, connection, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm, I'm extremely excited about sharing all of this knowledge and music and, and also personal heritage that, um, that I have and sharing it with communities um, where I lead services and where I'm teaching. What optimistic thoughts do you have about the realm of Jewish music as we're moving forward? Ah, well, um, you know, when I started, do you, when I started performing Middle Eastern Jewish music here in the U.S., there were hardly any other Middle Eastern Jews who were interested in delving into their own Middle Eastern heritages. I was, I kind of felt like <laughs> I was the only one and I didn't really have a chevra. Um, today, there are all sorts of young people um, in their 20s and 30s who are interested in mining their own um, musical heritages. And so, there's just a lot more, um, it, that's just been really exciting for me personally, um, to be able to teach them and to have people seeking me out because I really used to perform mostly exclusively for Ashkenazi audiences, which is not a bad thing, but it's been really exciting for me to see that there are all these young people who, um, who want to share their own, um, to, to share their own um, heritage with, with everybody else, so. There's certainly a lot of the most of the most of the pop stars in Israel, of course, are, are Mizrahi kinds of singers. But I wanted to ask you, since you're sharing and teaching, do you give lessons on that distinct vocal style that we hear from you and that we'll hear from you on the play out? Um, no, um, I don't. You know, it's interesting. I so I, I didn't really get to explain that. Like ultimately, I had to study. Um, to study to sing Persian classical music and to start to sing to really immerse myself in Middle Eastern music and that's how I started singing it but 
this, this style of Persian classical music known as takrir, where you sing, it's kind of like the breaking of the voice. You know, that style, I never, ever thought would come from my voice. I mean, I sang Western classical music. I'm a soprano. And um, when I was in Israel and I sought out um, this Persian music teacher, um, he, I said, you know, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can sing like that. And he said, um, for, for me, the only thing that resonated was crying. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. And he's like, you know, it's like crying. It's like, ho, 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 ho. It's like crying. And somehow that opened it up for me. So if I was going to teach someone, there you have it. Um, that would be what I would teach someone. But I, you know, I'm certainly not, I, I would, um, uh, I have not yet. I guess I could teach a student to do that, but um, but I, uh, I I haven't yet. A few have asked me, but not yet. Monty, Philippe, uh, it's time to answer some questions from our audience out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone asks, uh, can you describe the tonal system of Persian music? Is it like the makam of, uh, of Arabic music? Yeah, so um, yes, it is very similar. Um, uh, it's a little bit different <clears throat> in terms of, um, so I, I don't want to get into it too deep without explaining it all, but basically Middle Eastern music in general is different from Western classical music because um, really, instead of thinking about a scale, you're thinking about tetrachords. And so um, maybe there'll be uh, like a, a quarter tone in the second note, instead of do, re, mi, fa, you know, in a, a natural minor, it'll be do, re, and there you have the quarter tone on the re. Do, re, mi, fa, fa, mi, re, do, re, that's bayat. So, so um, in, um, in Persian classical music, it's called a daska system. And you also have, um, t you have it based on tetrachords, but there are, slight, there are different rules. You're moving from a, um, they're called gushe. And um, I'm not really sure what, how you would translate that in English, but you're, but you, you're landing in a completely, within a, within a daska, which is like a makam, you have different places where you land and you're in different tetrachords and you kind of are working with their very specific rules. So I would say, yes, it's similar, but you have more specific rules in Persian classical music that really limit your options. It's, it's, it's more, um, uh, um, the rules are more clear and they're less, uh, you can't move out of that system, so. Okay, okay. well, if someone has a some sort of similar question about vocal production. Is there a difference in vocal production between Persian and Middle Eastern style and Ashkenazi? Oh, between Middle Eastern and Ashkenazi, yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, the primary difference is chest voice versus head voice. Mm -hmm. I would say that's the that's the primary difference, you know. Um, uh, if I was going to sing, you know, like I was uh, talking about before, versus which is completely from my chest voice. And there are some uh, ways that you can combine. Uh, I do a lot of combining and switching back and forth, but I would say in general, those are the two, um, those are the major differences. This is in, in almost all Middle Eastern music, you're primarily using your chest voice. Interesting. Okay, we have a question from a cantor who says there are 54 parish, parishot. I'm not aware of 54 unique makamat. I guess that would that some makamat may get repeated through the cycle of the parasha? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the answer. Simple one. <laughs> um, 
you know, I'm, I'm also interested in you both, both you and Mati come from very different kinds of backgrounds, uh, musically and ritually. But despite those differences, there is the commonality of text. And I was wondering how those two traditions speak to one another. And maybe you can both chime in about that. I'm not sure, can you, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. Can well, a little bit more what there's the commonality of the text, but the different styles. Now, how do the, is there a blending at some point? Is that part of what you're trying to do? And, uh, and how, how does Mati view that and keep that in, in his tradition? Mati, you want to start? I, I'll, sure, I'll jump in. <laughs> there is a text and music are frequently married to each other, but frequently uh, at odds with each other. Uh, because when the text and the music agree, that is to say, when the music is an illumination of the text, then you're able to combine both sides of the brain. The part that's uh, the cognitive part, that's the text, and the other half of the brain that responds to the emotional dimension. Uh, of course, when we uh, sing just music, either uh, a wordless nigun or listen to any of the great Western compositions, the words seem to be superfluous because the language of music speaks in not specific ways, but in deeper psycho-emotional ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but the total uh, combination of text and music certainly works best in worship, I think, um, although Either or works perfectly well too. A silent devotion is pretty good. A wordless nigun is very good. And when it comes to being inspired uh, by Beethoven or Bach uh, with non-texted music, that's pretty up there too. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, look, I sing a lot of as a as a cantor, you know, as a shlichat sibor. I sing a lot of. Um, wordless music. Um, in the Middle Eastern Jewish tradition, there, there isn't a lot of that, right? There is, it's about the text with the music. Um, but, um, you know, for me, it's not that different, I guess. Uh, you know, it, you're interpreting, if you're singing without words, you're still interpret, you're, you're, you're choosing something that's in, in the moment. And it's the same if you're choosing a piece, you know, if it's in the service, obviously it's, you're, inter you're, you're going with the service. But um, uh, obviously if you're singing without words, it can, it, it gives you freedom to kind of do whatever you want. Um, when, you're, when you're interpreting a text, yes, you, you, you're, you're less, con um, you're, you're more confined. Um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question, Jim. Well, well perhaps there's, there's <laughs> another question that you can answer from someone else. And that is, uh, Gali, uh, do you explore other ethnic music and incorporate it? Perhaps African, Eastern European, or, or Asian? Yeah, so, um... I certainly um, am not a purist, and um, I have no problem, for instance, if I'm singing a Persian piece, bringing in some Arab uh, um, musical traditions, and, you know, sometimes even some Indian music influence. I play, I play music with a tabla player. Um, my divan has, uh, has tabla, Indian tabla, and a Latin percussionist who plays um, uh, cajon and congas. So I am very comfortable mixing, uh, um, tr mixing in musical sounds from other traditions. And I also, I'm, I feel kind of thankful because of my um, anthropological background, which has taught me that music isn't static. And I know historically that people have always been influenced by other musical traditions. 
um, I think that has always happened naturally. So, um, so absolutely, I think I'm completely comfortable. Uh, I think I, on my first album with Yvonne on Yari Bon Olam, which is an Iraqi piece, we brought in banjo. So, um, and you know, there's some gospel sounds in there. So, um, <clears throat> in spite of the fact that I am very knowledgeable about the music that I study, I don't feel like you can't uh, borrow from other musical traditions and you can't have fun with it and you can't, I mean, I am, uh, you know, there was a question about whether I combine the, I mean, I can't help but combine these styles that I come from because that's who I am as a musician. And I wouldn't want to push those, those influences and the musical styles that I like and that I hear, I wouldn't want to not be able to bring them in. So I'm open to all musical influences and traditions that I like. Wonderful. <laughs> um, I think I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, but one thing I would like to, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Devon and, and what you're doing. I know that um, you have a new album out and that uh, it's wonderful, but uh, the release happened just as the COVID was really coming into into play, and you couldn't tour. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. I. I mean, I wish that was the biggest problem in the world. But <laughs> yes, um, we we released an album on March seventh, and um, we miraculously were able to have our album release at Joe's Pub in Manhattan, and. Um, we're very excited to be able to do that. And, uh, and the album is called Shalhevet, um, which literally means flame. And uh, well, our, we're, we're, we perform a lot of Pew Team, a lot, it's Middle Eastern Jewish music on this album. And you can actually see that album release if you want to. The Joe's Pub did a lot of um, put, many of its favorite performances from its archives on its website. So you can actually see that performance that we did at Joe's Pub and the album is called Shall Have It and it's available today. So thank you for that. I, I, I've, I was there for the, for the, the, uh, the broadcast and that's uh -huh. really remarkable and you. everyone should, I hope, support it. Um, and we have, and the final surprise is that you can hear one of the tunes that's going, uh, that's on the, uh, a premiere, so to speak, uh, one of the tunes, uh, uh, Galit's version of Ose Shalom, uh, which you're going to be hearing as the play out music. Right. So um, let me thank you, Mati, of course, for everything that you do, but for bringing Galit to us. Uh, thanks to everyone who's shared in this amazing program today. Thank you, Galit, for this fascinating discussion and for all that you do. Um, if you enjoyed the program and would like to learn more about the work of the Zamir Coral Foundation, please go to zamirkoralfoundation.org. And if you would like to make a donation, any amount is appreciated. And you can, we'll have a, a a link in the chat box uh, that you can you can then click and uh, and make a donation or find out more about the foundation. Uh, and we hope you'll also stay tuned in the future for conversations that we're having like the one today. And tell your friends too. And so, I want to thank you, thank you, Jim, and thank you so much, Mati, for having me. Thank you, Galit, and and thank you, Jim. What a pleasure this was. Let's play out.
That was great, Galit. So Thank super. You. Thanks, Jim. Galit, you know, I didn't say it in, uh, when we were talking, but I once have a friend who is a high church musician. You know, perfect pitch, play 85 notes. He can tell you which three you're not playing. That kind of, you know, transpose to F sharp major just because why not? It's fun. And when, <laughs> I, play, and when I played him some of this Persian sound with, with that, uh, with the throat, with the break, which, you know, trained musicians try to avoid that break, but you revel in that break, at least that's the style. And he said to me, oh, that's just Jewish yodeling. <laughs> so I'd like to hear a, a, a yodel, a discussion of vocal yodeling and how that works, as opposed to what you're doing, because it is the same thing about the break and the falsetto and, and, and a head voice. And yeah, how that actually I mean works out. I mean, I think all of those uh, those traditions are similar. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, uh, and it's not a Jewish thing, by the way. It's yeah. a Persian, Persian thing. thing. It's a very Persian thing. You don't hear it um, in other Middle Eastern styles. You hear it a little bit in, in Iraq, parts of Iraq that border Iran. Um, uh, and maybe maybe some Afghani um, music, but it's just that area. It's just that you know that small area. So I mean, I don't have any major insights to you on the connection between yodeling, but I would say yes. It. I mean, there's no question that um, you're, there, there was, are similar things that you're doing to manipulate your vocal cords. And um, uh, sorry, Joanne, that you didn't like that style. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll let my ancestors know that you find it grating. Um, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, it, would, it would be fun to hear, uh, uh, not a sing-off, but uh, uh, if there was one, one tune or at least a phrase that we could get vocal stylists of, of all these traditions, <laughs> and, and, including the, the straight tone. You know, so I love that. Make it happen. That'll yeah, be that we, should be in your series. Yeah, we'll we'll need serious funding to get that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very fun. Yeah. Let me ask you uh, when you're after you do that uh, kind of singing, do you have to uh, drink water or gargle <laughs> or something to be able to have that to go back to a western singing uh yeah. style? Because it, it would seem to me hard vocally it to is. be able to go back and forth and back and forth. Oh, I can. I can I can go back and forth, but it is um it it does like, you know, I can sing for hours and hours and hours in my head voice. Um I can't sing forever in my chest voice. Mm. I mean, maybe, you know, there are people that can. Um but yeah, it's it it is um it is more exhausting on the vocal cords. Yes. Mm. I think so, but I don't have a problem transitioning um, between the ch between the different styles. I mean, I rather enjoy it, um, but but it is. Um, but if I did that all day, my voice would be tired. No. Yeah. What would be a good medication for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Some I mean, Iraq. Iraq, exactly. Ah, oh, and someone wrote it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I will. I will uh, keep That's a little cool. bottle next to me on stage next time. That should be that should be part of the fee. Totally, I'll put that in the rider in the future. Right, the rider for the green room. Exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. Thank you. Next time, Jim. Next time we're in Boston, you'll see okay. that. Okay. Okay. See that on the rider. Khalid, is there anything that we didn't talk about that we should have talked about? Anything else that you wanted to share? I mean, I could talk for hours, Mati. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just excited to share my music and to have the opportunity to share my music. Well, you, you spoke so eloquently about it. You illustrated elegantly about it. Thank and you. It was a real thrill to have this conversation with you. And I'm so glad that you were able to uh, come in uh, and join us and share so much wisdom that I think most of our, uh, our listening audience or viewing audience or whatever you call a Zoom audience, um, I'm sure they were unaware of. 
So uh, you spread your message, and I think uh, besides gaining many new fans, I think you educated a tremendous number of people. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Gali. Thanks again. It was again. a lot of fun. I hope to My hope to see you again in person soon. Amen. Amen. And thank you again, Jim. Yeah. Nice conversation, Monty. It was thank good. Thank you. It was good. See you soon. Thanks. So long. Bye. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye.